Jesus died on the cross. In three days, he rose from the dead on Easter. They put Jesus' body in a tomb and then boarded the bowl to like in front of the opening. There's a circle rock blocking the door. It's dark. There's lots of rocks in there. And bears. Bears. They had to have two guards. They're wearing armor. They have big muscles. Mm -hmm. They have swords. Don't come in here. Nobody can push the rock. The guy that came to said, go on this and don't fall asleep, but they fell asleep. He was just in there. Play games. Mario Kart. <laughs> I don't just want to wait four more days. So now I get to go to Chuck E. Cheese. He was laying in there with clothes on him, and then the boulder was rolled away, and he was gone. Only the claws were there. An angel rolled it away. They, they jump and then they run away. <laughs> there are three women, and they're Jesus' friends. Mary and her friends. Pin spices on his body. How can there be Ten Marys, and they have the same name. I went somewhere. And I will come back to see you. Ew. I'm like, oh, no, there's an angel. Flap, flap. Oh! Hello. They have wands. An angel said he has risen. There's nothing in there. Because he was alive again. And the Marys are so happy. They were probably jumping up and down, saying, Hallelujah! <laughs> Martha and the other boy went away, but Mary stayed. He said, where did they put Jesus? To, to Jesus. She thought that it was the golden one. And he said, Mary, it's me. And then he said, Go tell the, the other men that I'm alive. So she ran to tell the disciples that Jesus was alive. She's running to go tell them, except it looks like a skipping kind of. And it looks like flying. <laughs> well, first they thought that she was just joking. Because once someone's dead, they're dead forever. He's gone, Mary, and he's still in her heart. Mary, you're cray cray. Cray 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 cray. cray, 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 cray. And they didn't know that they would put on God's plan just for him to be born so that he can die on the cross. Then Jesus came. Wow. Hello. What's for lunch today? Oh my goodness, it's Jesus. Remember me? I'll be going back. See you next time. I love you. How are you? He's powerful. He's the power of force and being in the world. He's the power of force. Jesus is my friend. Wow, that, <laughs> that's a great way to start out an Easter, an Easter morning.
That story is so good. It's so good, especially when we hear it from our children. Uh, but if you haven't read the whole story, I encourage you to do a little fact-checking on what we just saw. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can find it. It's written in all four of the biographies that we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But in the Gospels, it, it, if we understand uh, a little bigger context, the Gospels are just four books out of 66 other books that, that come together, written over 1,600 years by, by 40 unique authors, all inspired by God, and they compile what we call the Holy Bible. It's pretty amazing because it's written in three different languages by artists who were incredibly diverse. There were poets and politicians, farmers and fishermen, doctors, tax collectors, even kings. And together, they are responsible for the most published book in history. Now, this, this book, 66 different books put together, it's, it's actually one story, one meta-narrative, we call it. Really big story. And the epic story, it starts out with the explosion of, of creativity. The one true God speaks into existence all that does exist with, with simply a word, everything out of nothing. And, and, if, and if you persevere and you make it all the way to the end, you'll discover that the book concludes the same way that it began. God said, I am making all things new. This is such a great promise. I am making all things new. That includes you and me. That statement marks the end of human history as we know it and the beginning of eternity as we can only imagine. Revelation describes a dimension of reality beyond our understanding of, of space and time. It, it calls this reality heaven, a place where there is no more sorrow, no more tears, no more sickness or pain, a place where wrongs are made right, a place where we experience the presence of God unfettered, without limitation. And in between that, that very creative beginning and the newness of the ending between Genesis and Revelation, we, we discover the, the fall of humanity, we read about a a man in an ark, this, this incredible flood. We, we read about Israel, God's chosen people who, who are saved from, from Egypt. We read about temporary military leaders and temporary kings. We read about the rise and fall of nations, heroes and villains, tragedies and comedies, poems and laments. But listen, out of all the events that we find in this incredible book, there is one turning point. There's one defining moment. There's one inciting incident that changes everything. Everything. And it's the discovery of an empty tomb. You see, following the crucifixion of Jesus, two men took the lifeless body off the cross and they placed it in a tomb. And then three days later, when some of his followers went to take care of that body, because that's what they had to do, they found that the tomb, the tomb was, was empty. And what I want you to do this morning is think about the significance of that one event. Because when you think about it, everything, everything that predates the resurrection, it, it points to Jesus like there was 10,000 B.C. and 5,000 B.C. and 1,000 B.C. And, and then something happened. And then everything that postdates the resurrection, it, it just, it's, a, it's a countdown back to that moment in time. That moment in time when, when heaven invaded earth, when eternity overcame time, when, when life defeated death. And so this morning, with Christ followers throughout the ages, I just want to let you know that I, I believe to the core of my being that Jesus is risen, that Jesus is risen. Alive. We're going to unpack the story a little bit this morning. But before we get there, I just want to invite you to pray with me, to, to ask God to, to, to let him know that we know he's here, 
and to welcome him and, and maybe, maybe have him uh, speak to us, to meet with us in this time. Because I think that's why you're here this morning. I know that's why I'm here. So let's, let's pray together. Let's invite God into this time. If you would, just bow your heads. Heavenly Father, God, it's our privilege to be here this morning, to be able to gather in this place. Father, thank you for being here. And God, I, I just humbly ask that, that, you would, that you would stir our spirit, stir our memory. Help us to know who you are and, and in this moment, God, who you're calling us to be. And that because of Jesus, we have access to you. We can experience your love, your grace, and your forgiveness. And I pray that happens in these moments, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, it's good. It's good to be here this morning. For those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Michael Gross. I'm lead pastor of the quarry. Uh, welcome. And for those of you guys joining us online, really glad that you are with us as well. It's good to be together to celebrate the resurrection of, of Jesus. But I want to I step this back just a little bit and, and just, just ask the question. I mean, do, do you believe? Do you, do you believe this? I know a lot of us show up on Easter for all different kinds of reasons. A little arm twisting. Maybe, maybe there's some ham or potatoes in it for you a little bit later. But we gather. But we gather around an event. We gather around a person but do you believe? Do you believe that Christ rose from the grave? And do you understand, and this, this is kind of the bigger question for all of us, do you understand the significance of this historic event in your life? Like what difference does it make? Do you believe? Because there's, there's a lot of reasons not to believe, right? There, there are questions we have. And when we have questions that are unanswered, doubt creeps in. I mean, like, like is this story real? I mean, what, what happened to the story? It's kind of an old story. So what happened over time? Did it change over time? And did, you, did Jesus really die or did he just kind of, was he mostly dead? I mean, what, and how do we know, how do we, how do we know that they really found Jesus? I mean, how do we know they didn't just, they weren't at the, the right tomb or, or maybe someone stole the body of Jesus? We have questions. And with unanswered questions, doubt creeps in and that that translates into how we live out this thing called faith. Now let me be clear. Faith is not the absence of doubt any more than courage is the absence of fear. You actually, you actually need one to have the other. Now I, I wish I could stand up in front of you today and I could say, well, I, I, have, I have no doubt. Like there's no doubt. But that's, that's not true. Because, because like you... I, I question. I, I have questions. I'm human. But there's this, there's this moment in the bio, biography of Jesus. It's so helpful when doubt creeps in. It, he, he, was, he was on his way to the city called Jericho. And he meets, meets a man whose son suffers from these seizures. And they keep happening. The man, the man has no idea what to do. But Jesus comes into the scene and he's heard about this Jesus. And so he, he asked Jesus, would you have mercy on us? And if you can, would you, would you help us? And Jesus says, all things, all things are possible to him who believes. And here's what the boy's father says in this moment. In this statement, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's just so unassuming. He says, I do believe. I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. That, that moment, it's like a, a little microcosm of our reality. That's Father in that moment. He's speaking for all of us, right? Because we are all just this mixture of faith and doubt. Because we just, we, just, we just don't know. And that uncertainty, it causes tension. I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Now, if we were able to be honest with one another, 
all of us are caught between faith and doubt, between certainty and unanswered, sometimes unanswerable questions. By, by definition, that word doubt, it means to be uncertain about something. And that uncertainty comes in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. There's, there's intellectual uncertainty. Like, I, I, don't know, I don't know what to think. There, there's theological uncertainty. Like, I don't know what to believe. There's circumstantial uncertainty. Like, I'm not sure what to do. Something, something happens. And it doesn't fit into our, our neat and tidy world view. It creates tension. It doesn't add up. It creates anxiety and angst inside of us. It's like, it's like when bad things happen to good people and we don't have an answer for that. Or we experience some kind of injustice. It's, when we, it's what we feel like when we, when we go through something as difficult as a divorce. Or, or we receive a diagnosis. Or we grieve the loss of a of one that we love much. It's in that space that we find those who loved Jesus the most right after the crucifixion of the one they thought was their savior, the one they knew to be their friend. Their minds were racing, their hearts were pounding, their, their compass, which, which pointed in a direction at one time, is now just kind of spinning out of control. Maybe you can relate. That's where we're going to start our reading in Luke 24. If you have your Bibles, and, and if, you, if, you're, if you're here for any length of time, you'll hear me say this again and again. Open up your Bibles. Let's, let's look at this together. Let's, let's, let's learn together. Now, if you don't have a Bible, no problem. We'll have the words up on the screen. But I want us to be students of Scripture. Luke 24 starts here. Now, on the first day of the week, this was a Sunday, at early dawn, the women went to the tomb, taking the aromatic spices that they had prepared. They, they found that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood beside them in dazzling Attire. Now that word, that word that, that we translate as perplexed, that word means to be puzzled. It, it means to experience anxiety, uncertainty. One, one different translation reads that they didn't know what to think. Another one says that they were confused. A literal translation of the original Greek language could read, I am in doubt. I don't know what to do, I don't know what to think, I don't know what to make of this. And I think if we came upon the situation, we would be in that same boat. Because there's no precedent here, there's no, there's no category for what they are about to discover. Verse 5, the women were terribly frightened. I mean, they just came to prepare the body. The friend, but he's not there. And so they bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has been raised. Remember, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And then the women remembered his, his words. I love this part of the story. When their memories are, are stirred. So you and I, we, we have this tendency to remember the things we should forget and forget the things we should remember. And often that, that's the difference between living in faith and living in doubt. I, I think living in faith, it's a, it's a function of remembering God's consistency in our lives over time. While living in doubt, it's, it's forgetting living in this state of amnesia of who God is and, and what he has done in your life. We forget that which we should remember. And I think this would be a, a really good prayer. I don't, I don't know how much you pray, but this is a great place to start. God, would you, would you stir my memories of you? Would, you? would you stir in me? Remind me of who you are and what you have done. Remind me of what you have spoken over me, of who you say that I am. Remind me, God, of your greatness, of your power, of your glory. Stir in me. 
Help me to remember. Verse 9, and, and when they returned, so the women, they returned from the tomb. They, they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. And then we get a little list of, of who it was that was there. There's Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told all these things to the apostles, those who were closest to Jesus. I, I think this is so important, especially at this moment in our time, in our culture. That, that don't, just, don't just gloss over this. See, the, the women are the first to witness the most magnificent event in all of history. Now, it, it could have been men, right? It could have been Peter, it could have been John or James or Andrew, but that's not the story. God used women, hear this, to preach the first Christian sermon ever. Hey guys, the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. But just like you, the apostles, those who were closest to Jesus, they, they were a part of what we'll call the doubters club. Right? Let's pick it up at verse 11. But these words seemed like pure nonsense to them. Hey, men, men, if, if, if your wife says something, most likely it's true, okay? Just take that in, all right? Come on. But these words, they seemed like pure nonsense to them, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and he ran to the tomb. He bent down and he saw only the strips of linen cloth. And then he went home wondering what had happened. Listen, I, I, love, I love the way that, that Peter responded to this, right? He, so, he, so he hears from the women. He's kind of, I don't, I don't know, maybe, and he kind of casually saunters over to the tomb. That's not what it says. It says the dude got up. I mean, he might, he might have had questions. He might have had doubts. He's like, what? And he got up and he ran to the tomb. These are words to live by, right? Because when, when your circumstances don't make sense, when we, we forget, we, we run to an empty tomb. It stirs us. When, when it feels like, like, like your life is falling apart, when you're wrestling with doubt, I want to encourage you, run to the empty tomb. When all else fails, run to the tomb. Because the empty tomb, it's, it's the answer to a thousand questions. It's the solution to a thousand different problems. Because the empty tomb screams, Christ is risen. He's alive. It is our foundation, and it is solid. On April 14th, 1755, a man by the name of General Edward Braddock, he was a British officer and commander-in-chief of 13 colonies during the French and Indian War. This, this predates the Revolution. So he sails up the Potomac River to this sleepy little hamlet called Georgetown. Braddock anchored his ship there. And if, and if you like history, this is where he also picked up a, a young military recruit, 23 years old, by the name of George Washington, who would serve as his aide-de-camp, kind of his right-hand man. Now, fast forward a couple hundred years, just a stone's throw away from what we know as the Lincoln Memorial, there's this nondescript stone well with a small historical marker right next to it. And, it, and if you were to lift up that, that manhole cover that, that covers that stone well, you'll find a ladder that takes you 16 feet below ground to, which, to that which was once a, a substantial rock landmark. And that rock is called Braddock's Rock. And it's the place where General Edward Braddock anchored his ship on April 14, 1755. It ranks as the oldest landmark in the nation's capital predating the American Revolution by several decades. Now, here's why that's important. Braddock's Rock, it was that initial point for the earliest surveys of the capital city. And if you, if you look at old maps of the city, the landmark is called the Key of All Keys. It established the coordinate system for the entire city. So if you wanted to know where to put a street or where to put a building, you would measure off of that rock you would go back to the key of all keys. Now hold on to that thought for just a second. 
And let me take, take you back 2,000 years. Where Jesus Christ was betrayed. He was arrested, ultimately crucified in a place called Golgotha. Understand, uh, in, in first century Judea, death by crucifixion, it, it wasn't uncommon. Some archaeologists uh, estimate that over a thousand crucifixions took place every single year. That's something like three every day. So the crucifixion of Jesus between two criminals is, is, is kind of par for the course. Lots of people died on Roman crosses, but, but hear me. Only one predicted their death. We just read about it and, and, and pulled it off. And his name is Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. When, when he died on that cross, his body, it was placed in a tomb belonging to somebody else, a guy by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. This is an interesting little detail that's, that's put into the story, but it has so much meaning. This is so good. I mean, who, who borrows a tomb from somebody else? Well, somebody who's only going to need it for three days, right? This is a little subplot within the larger story, but it fulfills ancient prophecy. Prophecy is, there, there's over 300 prophecies about Jesus that we find in the Old Testament, the first half of what we call the Bible. And, and these prophecies, they, they tell us who the Messiah is going to be. And this one, this one, wow. So, so 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah identifies the Messiah this way. Listen, listen to these words. That, that they, intend, they intended to bury him with criminals. This is who the Messiah is going to be. But he ended up in a rich man's tomb because he had committed no violent deeds, nor had he spoken deceitfully. All right, so, so in other words, Jesus had two graves. The Messiah is going to have two graves. Like, like every other person who is crucified by the Romans, Jesus was assigned a grave. He's like criminal number 354. Okay, we're going to bury you right here. So he had one grave. This, this fulfills the first part of the prophecy now, the other half is fulfilled when a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea offers him his tomb. Jesus was placed in that tomb. A large stone was rolled in front of the entrance to that tomb. And then, according to Roman custom, the, the tomb was sealed. Right? So we would know if, if someone messed with it. But not only that, there were Roman guards placed outside of the tomb. Why? Because there was a rumor that somebody was going to try to steal the body and start a revolution. The guards were there to prevent that from happening, which if you think about it, gives us even more evidence that, that no one stole the body. That's not what happened. See, the tomb was empty. Not because they misplaced the body, not because somebody took the body, but because something unusual, something unpredictable, something prophesied. Even supernatural took place. So it's dawn on day three following the death of Jesus. Some women go to the tomb. And as they approach the tomb, they notice that the stone is rolled away. That's not normal. Matthew's gospel records it in this way. Now after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. A lot of Marys. Suddenly there was a severe earthquake for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were shaken and became like dead men because they were so afraid of him. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's been raised just as he said. See, friends, the empty tomb, the empty tomb is our key of keys. It's, it's the, the rock that was rolled away. It's, it's how we measure time and eternity, life and death. This is where God asserts his authority, his, his sovereignty over creation. This is where heaven invades earth. See, as followers of Jesus, we don't believe in happily ever after. 
We believe in God's power and compassion. We believe in happily forever after. We believe that the tomb was empty. That he's alive. Now, now some, some think Christianity is, is like this, lo- this list of do's and don'ts. Kind of a moral code that we can boil it down to that, that we practice something called the Sermon on the Mount where, where we love our enemies and we bless those who curse us and we turn the other cheek, we go the extra mile. But listen, this isn't about behavior modification. Jesus didn't come to just make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people alive. That's the point. That's the bottom line. You and me. Right? We are, we are dead in our sin, but because of Jesus, we've been brought back to life. And not just any kind of life, life to the full. Not just the life you had before, but a life, life with God. See, Christianity is not simply a religion, but correctly defined, it's a relationship with a risen Savior. Right, it's 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 that it's that song that I sang with my family, and we're all it's Easter, and we're we're in the pew, and I look over at my dad, and my dad is, he does this when he sings, he's in it, you know. I, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever men may say, I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer, and just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. That's what we believe. That's our key of keys. So I want to wrap this up with two questions. And I really, I think, think about these things. Don't, don't, don't just let this fly over your head. Just think about these things. So, so 2,000 years ago, the world woke up. I mean, you hear what I'm saying? To an empty tomb. Empty tomb. The sinless Son of God, crucified, dead, and buried, conquered the grave on that third day. And when Jesus walked out of that tomb, the impossible, your freedom, my freedom, became possible. And so here's the questions that matter to you and to me. Do you believe? And what are you doing with that? Are you living like you believe? Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll enter into freedom. Now understand that with, with, with things in history, we, we can't prove or disprove them. We can't prove or disprove the resin, resurrection of Jesus. We can rationalize and believe, okay, that makes sense to me. But it's a step of faith every single time. But that empty tomb and what that empty tomb meant, that Christ was raised from the dead, and the testimony surrounding this historic event, the prophecies fulfilled, and the the result and profound life change equate to the foundation of our faith. It's a foundation that is sturdy, that is sure, that is time-tested. Our key of keys, it is the focal point of our confidence, it is the genesis and revelation of our hope. And so with that in mind, have you, ever, have you ever made a profession of faith? Have you ever surrendered your life to the lordship of Jesus? Because you can do that right here, right, right now. And it's as simple as ABC. A, all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not alone. You are in really good company. You're not the only one. We're in this together. All of us are just a mess apart from God. B, believe in the Lord and you will be saved. That's the promise. C, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Listen, I believe Jesus is exactly who he said he is. He's the Son of Man, the Word of God. He is one with the Father. He is the great I Am. I believe Jesus died on that cross in my place, and he rose from the dead on the third day. And right now, he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And so if you want to make that profession of faith today, if you want to surrender your life 
to the headship, to the leadership, the lordship of Jesus. If you want to receive the grace that only comes from Jesus, we want to help you with that. We want to walk alongside you in that. You're not supposed to do this alone. So whether you're, you're watching online or you're right here with us in person, you, you can go to the Quarry app or, or you can just use this QR code. Yeah. You can, you can uh, just click on that thing and it will take you to a form. And just, just fill that thing out and just let us know. You know what? I, I want to give my life to Jesus. And we, we want to enter into that with you. We're going to send you some stuff that will help you. We're not going to fill your mailbox with a bunch of junk. We want to help you take steps of faith. Second, for those of you who have been believers for a time, you would say, you know what, I believe. Are you living like you believe? A few years back, Pastor Craig Rochelle, he wrote a book titled The Christian Atheist. Curious title. A Christian atheist is someone who professes to believe in God, but lives like he doesn't exist. And Craig asks this question. He says, if you, were, if you were to be put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's a hard question. The resurrection of Jesus isn't something we celebrate one time a year with Easter bunnies and Easter bonnets. As followers of Jesus, we celebrate our risen king every day in so many different ways. And we, we call that worship. That's what it means to worship. We live this way because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us and changes us. And when enough people allow the spirit of God to change them, it changes the world. That's what has already happened. And that's what can happen again. 2,000 years ago, if you were placing bets on the Roman Empire or this thing called Christianity, I'm guessing you'd put your money on Rome. Rome Rome ruled the world, right? And Jesus had this handful of followers. They were were uneducated, under-resourced, underwhelming. They they weren't what we would call first-round draft picks, if you know what I mean. But here we are. 2,000 years later, and you may eat an occasional Caesar salad, but you can't name me five Caesars. The Roman Empire is long gone, but two plus billion people call themselves Christians. That's a third of the world's population who identify with this person named Jesus of Nazareth. And what's that all about? I think the best explanation is an empty tomb. Jesus is alive. He he rose from the grave. He defeated death and he declares freedom for anybody who will choose to follow him. It is yours if you will take it, if you will receive it. Do you believe that? God died for you and he has abundant life for you. He lavishes his love upon you. Will you receive it? Will you trust him? Will you live in that faith? Let me end by by just commissioning you in this moment. If you're a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you to be a person that when the doubt creeps in, that you run to the tomb, that you run to the key of keys. And when you run to the tomb and you find it empty, when your spirit is stirred, I, I I want to encourage you to allow the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to fill you with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and that you trust Him enough to take the step that He is calling you to take, that you will follow His lead because He is risen. Jesus is alive. That's what we're here this morning to celebrate. So let's pray.